Welcome back to the University of Florida Nephrology Ultrasound video series. Hope you enjoyed our introductory videos and already incorporated or considering to incorporate ultrasonography into your practice. In this video, I am going to show you some of the commonly encountered abnormalities that you would encounter while performing urinary tract sonography. The presentation is in multiple choice question and answer format. So let's get ready for the quiz and see how much you remember from my previous videos. And don't worry, uh, there are no negative points for answering wrong. Let's start with a very brief refresher about the terminology and renal anatomy. We describe the grayscale ultrasound findings in terms of relative echogenicity. That is, how echogenic a particular structure is compared to the surroundings. The more echogenic a structure is, the brighter it appears on the monitor. In this picture, if you have to describe the appearance of the circular area in the middle, you would say this is hyperechoic because it's brighter than the surrounding area. In other words, this structure is making more echoes compared to its surroundings. Examples of some of the bright structures you will encounter while doing abdominal ultrasound are stones, bones, that is ribs, fibrous structures such as diaphragm, and renal sinus fat. Note that the stones and bones don't let any sound waves pass through them, so they form a shadow beneath them. So assume if this is a stone, you'll find a shadow beneath this structure. And uh, fibrous structures such as diaphragm or renal capsule, they still allow some sound waves to pass through them, so there will not be shadow, but these things appear bright. And this area here is darker compared to the surrounding structure. That's why it's called hypoechoic. That means it's making less echoes compared to the surroundings. An example would be the appearance of renal medullary pyramids compared to cortex. Or uh, it could be renal cortex compared to that of liver. And here, you are even not able to delineate the structure. And that means it's pretty much of same intensity as the surrounding area, which means it's isoechoic. An example would be um, renal cortex compared to that of liver still. And uh, this, this structure here is anechoic, which means it does not make any echoes or pretty much appears black on renal ultrasound. Uh, example of anechoic structures on uh, ultrasound would be anything that contains clear fluid. For ultrasound purposes, blood is clear fluid, serous fluid in a cyst is clear fluid, and uh, urine is clear fluid. So when you have hydronephrosis, you see a black thing or anechoic thing in the middle of the kidney. Or kidney cyst, or cyst anywhere, if it's a simple cyst and containing a serous fluid, it will appear black. And blood vessels containing blood, they appear black on ultrasound. Now, the anatomy of the kidney. Each kidney consists of an outer cortex and inner medulla that is organized into pyramids. And extensions of renal cortex project in between these renal pyramids and this is completely normal and these are called columns of Burton. It's important to know that these things exist because sometimes they can get hypertrophied and can mimic a mass. So you need to know what is normal uh, to distinguish from a renal mass. And now pyramids open into minor calices, uh, which is the first part of the renal collecting system, which open into major calices here, and which fuse to form this funnel-shaped structure, the renal pelvis, which ultimately continues as ureter. And you see the gaps here in between the renal collecting system and the parenchyma. Those gaps are uh, in normal kidney, they are filled with fat which is called the renal sinus fat. So this is a, a kidney specimen that's showing the cortex, pyramids, and the renal sinus fat, and the collecting system. And on grayscale ultrasound images, this is how longitudinal image of the kidney looks like. Uh, because it has a nice bright cortex, uh, it gives the kidney the bean shape, and it, it makes it easily identifiable. And you have the cortex here, which is hypoechoic. Uh, usually we compare the echogenicity of the cortex to that of liver on the right and the spleen on the left. And here you see medullary pyramids, which are black uh, on most occasions. And sometimes they're just hypoechoic and not anechoic or completely black. And sometimes you might not be even able to see the medullary pyramids clearly. It's okay. 
and here you see the bright or hyperechoic sinus fat and here is the renal pelvis area. Note that in a normal kidney, the brightest structure is uh, after the capsule, it's the sinus fat. And the collecting system or the renal pelvis area is not black unless you have urine um, uh, backing up, which is hydronephrosis. And ureters are normally not visible in a healthy kidney unless, again, you have distended ureter because of the urine backflow. And this is how a kidney looks like in the transverse section. And here you see the cortex, you have medullary pyramids here, and you have the sinus fat, and this structure right here is probably a blood vessel, uh, most likely a renal vein. And this is not ureter because this structure is appearing blackish or like at least hypoechoic here which means uh, that it contains fluid uh, and we know that normal ureter is not black or visible unless it's distended. So this is most likely a vessel, um, most likely a uh, renal vein. And this is how urinary bladder looks like on uh, ultrasound and essentially it's a fluid filled uh, structure so when it's filled with urine urine is black so it appears as a black structure with uh, a, uh, echogenic border and in the sagittal view it's more or less triangular in shape and in transverse view it's rectangular and note that you shouldn't be evaluating um, any lesions evolving from the bladder wall unless it is filled with urine uh, if a bladder is completely decompressed you cannot evaluate its characteristics now the image orientation. As we discussed in the introduction video, the structure that is closer to the probe is on the top of the screen. And the farther structure is displayed on the bottom of the screen. So if you are imaging kidney from the lateral aspect of, um, of the body through the liver, liver is on the top of the screen and this side becomes lateral and this side becomes medial. And if you are imaging kidney from the anterior aspect, this side becomes anterior this side becomes posterior and the probe has an orientation marker right here um, which corresponds to the indicator on the screen um, and while performing the abdominal scan by convention the probe marker should be towards patient head while you are doing the longitudinal uh, scan and to the patient's right when you are obtaining transverse images so that means in longitudinal image whatever is corresponding um, to this uh, screen indicator is towards patient's head and the opposite side is towards patient's feet and in the transverse images this is towards patient's right and this is towards patient's left that means in this longitudinal image of the kidney if you find some abnormality say a cyst here you would say that there is a cyst in the upper pole of the kidney. You know it's upper pole because the screen indicator is pointing towards patient's head. So now let's start the questions. So the first question is pick the right tool. Which of these is abdominal probe? Is it this one um, which is curvilinear or this one which is uh, more squarish or this linear probe? or this longer one? So the answer is number one, the curvilinear probe. Probes have different frequencies and shapes. How do you select the right probe for your examination? High frequency ultrasound waves produce good resolution, but the depth of penetration is limited. These waves here have high, um, frequ high frequency, so they have high resolution, but they don't penetrate deep. So high frequency transducers are used to examine superficial structures such as nerves and vessels where the resolution is important. And low frequency ultrasound waves such as these blue ones here, they penetrate deeper but at the cost of resolution. So low frequency transducer is used to image deeper structures such as kidney. However, the resolution you get is enough to image the kidney because the range of pathologies is limited. Here is the curvilinear transducer that we use to image the abdomen. And uh, the shape allows you to image larger uh, organs and here this is the phased array or the cardiac probe. The mouth of this probe is squarish and small 
uh, which allows you to maneuver the probe in between the ribs. Otherwise, this is also a low-frequency probe. That means it penetrates deeper. And if you don't have uh, this curvilinear probe on your machine, you can use the cardiac probe to do the ultrasound of the kidney. And this is the linear probe, which has high frequency, and it's also called the vascular probe. So use it to do the vascular ultrasound or superficial musculoskeletal ultrasound. And this one right here is uh, the intracavitary probe. As the name suggests, you will use this probe to um, do intravaginal scans and uh, um, uh, pararectal scans or oral scans. Where, and these probes are also of high frequency and allow good resolution. So the next question. The image demonstrates cysts in the left kidney. What is the artifact that you are seeing here that helps to identify cysts? Is it acoustic shadowing? Is it acoustic enhancement? Mirror artifact or twinkle artifact? So we are already saying that this image demonstrates cysts. So as we talked about, cysts have um, black uh, interior because they are fluid filled and they are well-defined uh, localized areas. Uh, that's why these are cysts, but they have some artifact that help you to identify them. And the answer is acoustic enhancement. What is acoustic enhancement? So it's essentially the bright area that occurs beneath structures that are excellent transmitters of sound waves. So cysts are good transmitters of sound waves and when the ultrasound beam encounters uh, a good transmitter or in other words a focal weakly attenuating structure such as a cyst, uh, the amplitude of the beam beyond the structure is greater compared to the surrounding area and it's falsely displayed as increased echogenicity on the monitor. And remember, this can occur with any localized fluid containing structure such as a cyst or urinary bladder, gallbladder, or even uh, transverse sections of blood vessels or localized collection of ascites. But in the kidney, uh, based on the anatomy, you know uh, that cysts appear as localized things um, as opposed to hydronephrosis, which tends to uh, occur as a, um, branched continuous structure. But any, any localized fluid will, uh, collection will produce enhancement. Next question. Here is a 60 plus patient uh, presenting with back pain and you perform a ultrasound of the abdomen and what's the likely diagnosis here? The first image is of the liver and this is the longitudinal section of the right kidney and this one is the longitudinal section of the left kidney. Uh, the options are, is it autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease or acquired cystic kidney disease or is it hydronephrosis of the kidneys and together with hemangiomas in the liver or it's extensive nephrolithiasis. So the first thing is, these things appear black uh, and they are localized structures without continuity. So in the kidney, they are less likely to be um, hydronephrosis. And in the liver, uh, they are less likely to be hemangiomas because hemangiomas tend to be slightly um, echogenic. And it's less likely to be nephrolithiasis because stones appear as echogenic structures, right? These are hypoechoic or pretty much anechoic localized structures, mostly corresponding to cystic lesions. And when you have these big kidneys with bilateral numerous cysts together with cysts in other organs such as liver, the most likely diagnosis is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And here is the next question. This is a 55 year old lady with recurrent urinary tract infections and you do a kidney ultrasound and uh, what does it demonstrate? The options are, is it again autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease? Is it nephrolithiasis? Or you see acoustic enhancement here? Or you see all of them? So here is the longitudinal section of the right kidney and the orientation marker is here. So this is upper pole, this is lower pole, and you are seeing something inside the kidney, um, which is one among these options. So. 
first thing is it's less likely to be autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease because you don't see any localized uh, black structures uh, that correspond to cysts. And as you already know, that acoustic enhancement is a property of cystic lesions. Uh, that means if you eliminated this option, this option is also gone. So you're left with nephrolithiasis. So the correct answer is nephrolithiasis, or you're saying stones in the kidney. So stones appear as bright or hyperechoic structures, uh, and they give acoustic shadowing. So acoustic shadowing occurs with structures such as stones, bones, or calcifications that do not transmit the sound waves. They essentially, like whatever ultrasound waves you are hitting this structure with, nothing is being transmitted. Some is reflected, some is absorbed, depending on the structure. So you will have a shadow beneath that structure. It's something similar to you're in the pathway of bright light, and you have a cast. Uh, I mean, sorry, you you form a shadow behind you, and that's what is essentially occurring here. Is just because of the uh, impermeability to the sound waves. That's why we call it acoustic shadowing. And these are nice long shadows. These stones are forming. And Usually stones are um, like intermittent, but if you are seeing stones like this, like like a continuous chain, it, they might uh, correspond to uh, staghorn calliculi because these horns of the uh, staghorn calliculus, when the ultrasound beam cuts them like this, they appear as like intermittent things, but in um, but like a chain. Next question: So what does this ultrasound image demonstrate? Is it a simple cyst or hydronephrosis or a complex cyst with septations and calcifications or is it autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease? Look at the image carefully and if it's not labeled, I can't even say uh, it's kidney, but the arrow is pointing towards some abnormal structure apparently. Uh, and it appears as a black localized structure. so it's less likely to be hydronephrosis. It's probably more pointing towards a cystic lesion. And here now the question is, is it autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease? With one cyst, I can't say that. Uh, and uh, and they're also not showing you um, cysts in other organs and uh, they don't give you any history. And is it simple cyst? It's not because it has something inside it. It's not like completely black. There is some whitish echogenic structure inside. That's why it's not a simple cyst. So we are left with complex cyst here. Okay. So we'll, we'll take a look at it further. So this is, first of all, a cystic lesion because it's a well-defined um, structure with um, a black interior and it gives acoustic enhancement here, the whitish area because of the good transmission of sound waves. Uh, you see the enhancement beneath it, this area. And these are fibrous septations. Remember, fibrous structures are also bright on ultrasound. And here, e these are likely calcifications. These more bright structures on these uh, fibrous septae, most likely they are calcifications. Why do I call them calcifications? Because like stones, calcifications also give shadowing. You see this area right here? So they are giving some shadowing, which you can uh, see within the area of enhancement if you closely observe. It doesn't mean that calcifications 100% of the time give shadowing. It depends upon how big is a calcification. If the calcification is um, smaller than the width of the ultrasound beam, you'll not see any shadowing. Uh, but uh, but when it's there, it's important to notice it. That gives you a clue that it's something calcified. And like I said, fibrous structures don't give shadowing. Typically, they are just bright. Okay, so that's why essentially this is a complex cystic lesion. Next question. So a 40-something-year-old man with multiple urinary tract infections in the recent past presents with fever, chills, and dull right flank pain. What is the likely diagnosis here? Is it a simple cyst or an abscess in the kidney, renal stone, or hydronephrosis? Well, looking at the history, it looks like there is some fever, some flank pain, UTIs. So it's kind of a pyronephritis picture. 
but there is no such option here anyways. So let's go one by one. Is it hydronephrosis? Eh, probably not because uh, hydronephrosis should be in the middle of the kidney, in the renal pelvis area, it's urine backup, it should be like a branched uh, interconnected area. And is it renal stone? No, we just looked at the picture saying that renal stones appear bright uh, with a shadow beneath them, so you don't see anything like that. So now we are left with simple cyst or abscess. So this structure, anyways, we already put the arrow here. So this structure here appears like a cyst because um, it's a defined localized structure and it has some enhancement here, if you closely observe. Even in this picture, it's more clear here. You have some enhancement. Uh, but it doesn't look like a nice, simple cyst uh, with a, a thin border. Uh, in fact, the border is like echogenic and little irregular. And now with this history of fever and UTIs is uh, raising the suspicion for abscess. So the most likely diagnosis here in the given options is a renal abscess. So now you must be thinking, how does a pyelonephritis look like on a renal sonogram? Unfortunately, ultrasound is relatively insensitive for diagnosis of pyelonephritis. If the clinical suspicion is high, you might just want to treat the patient empirically, or if you need some imaging, um, you can get a CT scan. And abnormalities are identified in less than one-third case of pyelonephritis on renal sonogram. And moreover, these findings are not like a single uh, defined entity. There are various findings that may suggest pyelonephritis. For example, you can see debris in the collecting system or pus in the collecting system called pyelone uh, pyonephrosis. Or you can see areas of uh, reduced cortical vascularity when you turn on the Doppler. Or sometimes you can see gas in the collecting system. Remember here, gas is white on ultrasound and uh, it gives dirty shadowing and moves around. So you don't want to mistake gas in the collecting system for stones, uh, then you would miss a life-threatening situation. And it can also appear as focal hypoechoic areas when there is edema, because edema is um, fluid, right? It appears more darker. Uh, or it can appear as focal hyperechoic area when you have hemorrhage. So clotted blood is um, echogenic, so that's why it appears hyperechoic. So this picture is an example of pyonephrosis. This is one of our patients uh, who came to the ED um, septic and uh, they did exploratory laparotomy, but they didn't find any source. But on renal ultrasound, we found this uh, pus in the collecting system. So this is the transfer section of the kidney. This is the liver. And this is the collecting system with this uh, black thing that is there is some hydronephrosis. And this dirty looking thing here, this echogenic thing, is pus in the collecting system. So this patient underwent uh, bilateral nephrostomy tube placement and recovered very well. And this ultrasound picture here shows, um, I mean, this is right kidney, this is left kidney, and the left kidney is bulky and hypoechoic. And on color Doppler, you can see that on the left kidney, the cortical vascularity is decreased compared to the right kidney. See, in the right kidneys, there are so many nice colors here um, in the cortex, and here you don't see any color. And uh, this picture shows the CT scan image of uh, pyelonephritis. Uh, where you see perinephric stranding. Remember that uh, a degree of symmetric bilateral perinephric stranding is relatively common, particularly in elderly patients. But when the history suggests pyelonephritis and uh, it is unilateral and asymmetric, uh, perinephric stranding is an important sign of renal inflammation or sometimes it can be seen even in acute obstruction. Now let's move on to the next question. What is the diagnosis here? So there is no history here, just the image, and they're asking you for diagnosis. Is this mild hydronephrosis or severe hydronephrosis, or you are seeing a renal stone, or you are seeing both hydronephrosis and renal stone? So here, in this longitudinal view of the kidney, you are seeing a black area in the renal pelvis, which corresponds to fluid, so that means there is urine backup and that means there is hydronephrosis. Is it mild or severe? Usually in severe hydronephrosis, the fluid extends more into the kidney and it compresses the cortex and medulla, but here it seems to be restricted to this area. So 
and they did not anyways give you the option of moderate hydronephrosis so it's most likely mild hydronephrosis and you can see this mild dilatation of the collecting system even in this picture and whenever you see hydronephrosis you look for the source of obstruction uh, sometimes the obstruction can be um, distal uh, to the uh, hydronephrosis uh, but if the patient has stone disease you can find other stones in the kidney as well so always look for kidney stones and in this picture you can see a hyperechoic structure here with a shadow this is more clear in the transverse view the hyperechoic structure here with a nice long shadow that means there is a renal stone also so the correct answer is both a and c this patient has mild hydronephrosis and you're also seeing a stone so let's see how we grade hydronephrosis there are various systems for grading uh, but we commonly say mild moderate and uh, severe uh, this is how a normal kidney looks like uh, it's well defined cortex and medulla uh, with pyramids and the papilla or the tip of the medulla um, opens into minor calyces which appear um, as concave structures or c-shaped structures which join major calyces the uh, and which join to form the funnel shaped area the renal pelvis which continues as ureter when you have mild hydronephrosis so the obstruction is somewhere distal here and you have urine backflow the first structure in the collecting system to dilate would be the renal pelvis this funnel here and if it's mild yeah it the fluid is around here but usually it does not compress onto the renal parenchyma much and these minor calyces here retain their uh, concavity or the C shape here where the medullary pyramids are joining them. And as the grade of the hydronephrosis or the severity of hydronephrosis increases, say now it becomes moderate. Now more uh, fluid is going into the kidney. That means there is more urine backflow compressing on the structures inside the kidney. So the renal pelvis is dilated even more. And these uh, calyces here, they are becoming convex and applying pressure on the parenchyma. See the medullary pyramids are not as nice and pyramidal shaped here. There is some compression from this uh, collecting system. And these minor calyces here, uh, there is no concavity here. Instead, they are becoming more convex. They are appearing like a cauliflower. And this is severe hydronephrosis where you see even more dilatation of renal pelvis and there is even more compression inside the kidney and you pretty much uh, don't see any pyramids. That's what we call loss of corticomedullary differentiation and cortex actually becomes thinner and just seen as a thin rim above the collecting system and the kidney turns into a um, ball of fluid. So here are the real-time um, images. This is mild hydronephrosis. Here the renal pelvis, the RP is renal pelvis that is dilated. This here is a dilated ureter or hydro ureter. And here you are able to see these uh, uh, calyces uh, distinctly. That, um, and you are also able to nicely see this cortex and uh, distinct pyramids. That means there is no pressure on the parenchyma here. So this is mild hydronephrosis just with uh, some dilatation of the renal pelvis and also a little bit of dilatation of uh, calyces. And here, this is moderate hydronephrosis because um, um, these caliceal borders are tending to become more and more, and more convex like cauliflower and starting to apply pressure on the parenchyma. And uh, if you see, compare this picture and this picture, this picture appears more black um, just because it, um, it's from a different machine. And also you're seeing more ureter here. In this picture, you're not seeing ureter. That's why it might appear um, slightly um, bigger hydronephrosis than it is really is compared to this one. But in reality, this is mild hydronephrosis and this is moderate hydronephrosis. And here, obviously, this is severe hydronephrosis. There is nothing you can see uh, apart from all this fluid-filled kidney. And the cortex has thinned very significantly. So next question, which is very easy after all these things. So this is an image of the longitudinal view of the right kidney and what is the diagnosis. Is it mild hydronephrosis, uh, severe hydronephrosis, huge cyst in the right kidney, or nephrolithiasis? So 
you are not seeing any obvious stone with a shadow, so less likely to be nephrolithiasis. Huge cyst, less likely. If it's uh, cyst inside the kidney, why would uh, this renal pelvis and ureter dilate? So it's hydronephrosis. Uh, is it mild or severe? Obviously, compared to the previous image, uh, there is a lot more urine backflow into the kidney with uh, compression of the parenchyma. So this is severe hydronephrosis. Next question. So you diagnosed severe hydronephrosis in this, uh, this patient and uh, you consulted urology. And now you repeated an ultrasound. And what are these arrows pointing to? Uh, these arrows. So the so did urology come and uh, put a nephrostomy tube or they put ureteral stent? Or are you seeing a staghorn calculus here in the kidney? And or you are seeing a blood clot in the bladder? Well, it's less likely to be a blood clot because it's very well-defined tubular structure here. And it's less likely to be staghorn calculus because stones, you're supposed to see bright structure with shadowing. There is nothing of that sort here. So it's either ureteral stent or nephrostomy tube. And because you're seeing a part of it in the kidney and part of it in the bladder, the correct answer is ureteral stent. So ureteral stent basically it extends from kidney to the bladder. That's why you are seeing a part here and this part in the bladder here um, in the ultrasound image. And if it was a nephrostomy tube, it wouldn't extend beyond the renal pelvis. So you wouldn't be seeing anything in the bladder. So the correct answer was um, ureteral stent. Oh, okay. Let's do the next question. So you performed a quick point of care ultrasound exam in this patient with near normal creatinine and microscopic hematuria. What's the immediate next step? So this is the longitudinal view of the right kidney and this is the transverse view of the right kidney. So you want to insert Foley catheter or consult urology or just press the Doppler button on the machine and take a look at the color images or reassure the patient and follow up with repeat urinalysis. You're seeing something blackish thing here in the renal pelvis area. So it's very reasonable to say that there is some mild hydronephrosis. But before you conclude, you might want to make sure that they are not blood vessels because blood vessel is uh, black on ultrasound because blood is black and urine is also black. So how do we know? Turn on the color mode. So you did turn on the color mode. So these are the findings. So what do we do now? Refer the patient to interventional radiology, insert a Foley catheter, oral antibiotic therapy for a presumed infection, or intravenous antibiotic therapy, maybe if you are thinking severe infection. So what are we looking at here? So corresponding to the same black area that you saw on the previous scan, now there is all color there with little bit of uh, turbulent flow as well, like blue and this mixture of colors here. So essentially, this is suggestive of uh, presence of blood vessels, that is um, um, arteriovenous malformation in the kidney. The first thing you ask the patient is if the patient had a kidney biopsy in the recent past, uh, which is one of the common reasons that can uh, lead to uh, arteriovenous fistula in the kidney. Or it could just be a congenital arteriovenous malformation. So obviously, this is not infection. This is a issue with the uh, uh, vascular structure. So you might want to refer the patient to interventional radiology to see um, if any intervention is needed. So correct answer is referral. And yes, the patient was referred to interventional radiology. Um, this is the MRA with the arteriovenous malformation in the kidney. And here is the angiogram picture showing the malformation. And um, the radiologist has put a uh, coil here and perform the coil embolization and the patient's hematuria resolved. Next question. So your point of care ultrasound demonstrated following findings in a patient with hematuria. And the patient's creatinine uh, was 2.5 milligram per deciliter and you don't know the baseline. Urinalysis is suggestive of urinary tract infection. What is the immediate next step? So do you want to insert a Foley catheter or consult urology or 
do you want to prescribe some antibiotic therapy or scan the bladder? So what are we looking at here? This is the longitudinal view of the right kidney and this is longitudinal view of the left kidney. And the diagnosis is certainly hydronephrosis because you see this black thing in the renal pelvis area extending into the kidney. Uh, here is the same thing. So this is a case of bilateral hydronephrosis. So the options are, I mean, if you want to put a Foley catheter, yes, that's a reasonable option. If you want to consult urology also, that's a reasonable option. And if you want to give antibiotic therapy because the urinalysis is suggestive of UTI, that's also good. But the immediate next step would be scanning the bladder. When somebody has bilateral hydronephrosis, you want to know if there is a bladder outlet obstruction, right? So now you scan the bladder. And what did it show? Is it bladder cancer or a bladder stone? or it's enlarged prostate with pressure effect on the bladder, or it's just a normal bladder. All these are possible, right? I mean, you can have bilateral uh, hydronephrosis without any bladder issues. You could have some uh, uh, fibrosis around the ureters, which could be giving bilateral uh, hydronephrosis. Or you can have something like this, a cancer stone or prostate, which could be causing bladder outlet obstruction. So in this image, what you're seeing is this hyperechoic structure with nice shadowing again like horseshoe shaped nice hyperechoic structure with a lot of shadowing here which is most likely a stone and if you are still in doubt you can move the patient around and the stone moves in the bladder so the likely diagnosis here is a bladder stone and this is a ct scan image from the same patient uh, showing this big stone here like measuring more than six centimeters and uh, this is the x-ray image obtained during the fluoroscopy showing the uh, big stone again and the patient was found to have um, urethral stricture. This is bladder ultrasound in an ICU patient. What does the arrow point to? Um, is it a bladder polyp or is it balloon of Foley catheter or a blood clot or is it a bladder cancer? So this arrow is pointing to some well-defined structure here. Um, it, first of all, we shouldn't be talking about bladder cancer when the bladder is not filled with urine because you don't want to evaluate any wall characteristics of the bladder such as clot or cancer uh, without the um, bladder being filled with urine. You, 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 you'll have false positives. Um, same is the case with polyps or anything uh, that grow into the bladder. Uh, other thing is that it is very well-defined structure and appears to be fluid filled. So this is most likely balloon of the Foley catheter. That is the normal appearance of uh, balloon of the Foley catheter actually. And the surrounding area is the decompressed bladder. So this is how a normal bladder that is filled with urine looks like. A well-defined structure that is anechoic because of the uh, urine that is anechoic. And if you put a Foley catheter, the Foley catheter has a bulb or the balloon that you fill with fluid. So this balloon is a well-defined structure filled with fluid, uh, something like a cyst. So it appears as like this. Uh, this is the balloon of the Foley catheter and it will drain the bladder, the Foley catheter. So you will have like very little amount of urine or pretty much no urine. So you have the surrounding bladder tissue decompressed around this uh, balloon. Now, this is a patient on intermittent hemodialysis that you're monitoring for renal recovery. And creatinine shows downward trend, but the patient is almost aneuric. The patient has a Foley and the bladder scan is shown. What do you do now? Do you want to continue the intermittent HD and monitor expectantly? Uh, or flush the Foley catheter and hold off on dialysis or call urology consult or call interventional radiology. So what are we looking at here? So you're saying uh, the creatinine is slightly improving but the patient remains aneuric. So you did a bladder scan to make sure there is no obstruction, right? So here is this nice well-defined structure corresponding to the balloon of the Foley. And when you have the Foley balloon, uh, you should have 
decompressed bladder or at least partially decompressed bladder but your bladder is like pretty much full and it, it appears like a normal bladder without a foley filled with urine so that means the foley is obstructed it's not uncommon to see such situations um, in ICU especially when the patient is aneuric um, so you should flush the foley catheter and hold off on dialysis and see if the patient improves this is bladder ultrasound in a patient with decompensated cirrhosis what is the next step? When I say decompensated cirrhosis, assume the patient has uh, SITs. So now, do you want to flush the Foley catheter or consult urology or perform a therapeutic paracentesis if indicated or remove the catheter? So if you look at the image, it looks like here there is a anechoic uh, fluid filled structure, but the Foley is posterior to uh, that structure. Remember, this is the anterior part that is closer to the probe. This is the posterior. So that means bladder, uh, the balloon of the Foley catheter is outside the wall of this anechoic structure. But this anechoic structure doesn't really look like bladder. It's with these irregular walls and all this. And we are also saying that the patient has ascites. Most likely this is pelvic ascites and not the bladder. And the Foley catheter is here, and you see some mild anecho anechoic structure around the bladder. So, that, uh, sorry, uh, around the Foley, that's the decompressed bladder. So, Foley is in the right position, but whatever you are seeing here that appears like a bladder is not bladder but pelvic ascites. You would easily know the difference when you turn the probe in the longitudinal view and see it is in continu uh, continuity with the ascitic fluid in the abdomen. So the correct answer is perform therapeutic paracentesis if clinically indicated and uh, don't do anything to the Foley because it's in the right position. Here is bladder ultrasound from uh, sedated female patient in ICU and the Foley bag is empty and she does not have any ascites. So what's the next step? Is the next step to flush the Foley catheter or you want to remove the Foley now or consult urology or monitor expectantly. Here we are saying the patient does not have ascites and this structure here is nicely defined and looks like bladder. But the Foley catheter here is again, the bulb of the Foley catheter is again posterior to this uh, bladder like structure. Most likely in this female patient without cirrhosis with this structure, uh, assuming it to be bladder, the Foley bulb is most likely in the vagina. So just deflate the bulb, pull out the catheter and uh, um, put back in the urethra and you will see the urine is draining out. So that means this is a misplaced Foley and the correct answer is remove the Foley. One important thing to note is that bladder outlet obstruction is not excluded just because the patient has a Foley catheter. And don't forget to scan the bladder um, wh when you have suspicion for obstruction, um, even if the patient has Foley catheter. And in this picture, you are seeing Foley bulb in the bladder, which is the right position. Here, in this female patient, the bladder is here, and the Foley bulb is here, posterior to the bladder in the vagina. That's a misplacement of uh, Foley catheter. And in a male patient, uh, you can prematurely inflate the bulb of the Foley in the prostatic urethra that can also lead to obstruction. So pay attention to the normal anatomy and the location of the Foley bulb. So this is the grayscale ultrasound image showing uh, full bladder and the Foley bulb in the prostate gland. This area around this Foley bulb is the prostate gland and you have inflated the Foley bulb here. Uh, so that means you are not draining the bladder and bladder remains full. Next question. This is a cirrhotic patient with acute kidney injury. Bedside bladder scan, uh, scanner reads 500 cc of urine, but there was no urine return on Foley catheterization. And you go and perform the bladder ultrasound. What does it show? Essentially, they are asking, uh, what do these 1, 2, and 3 correspond to? Look at these pictures first. So this is the transverse uh, image, just uh, when you put the probe uh, above the pubis. And this is also transverse, but you slightly tilt it upwards. And this is longitudinal view. That means you turned your probe longitudinally 
with the probe marker facing towards patient's head. And this is the right kidney longitudinal view. So what are we looking at? The first thing that you probably noted is that when you're looking at the kidney uh, uh, and this is the liver here, so all this thing is, this black thing here is ascites. So we said this is a cirrhotic patient. So this patient has significant amount of ascites. And here when we put the probe above the pubis and we looked up and also when we did the longitudinal view, it appears that all this fluid is in continuity. So this is all most likely pelvic ascites. So now we are sure that this at least number one corresponds to pelvic ascites. We don't know what two and three are. So what could be two? Could it be a bowel loop or could it be a uterine fibroid or the uterus itself? And if it's uterus, what is this then? This cannot be bladder because bladder is anterior to the uterus, not posterior. And if it's a bowel loop, uh, now we have to look and see if both these chambers are in continuity. So now you looked at the longitudinal view and here you see like all, both these compartments are connected. Like these are both the compartments and you see this organ like whatever that is here in the longitudinal view. So which pretty much looks like a uterus. So the options are this is bladder, uterine fibroid, uterus. That's not correct because uterus is not anechoic like this. And uh, I mean, it's not this big. And the patient already had ascites and you know that the fluid is in continuum, so number one is not bladder. So that excludes option D also, uh, without even considering the rest of the things. So it's either B or C. So that means one is definitely pelvic ascites. And I already said that bladder is not posterior. So the number three cannot be uh, bladder. So this option is excluded. So the correct answer is number three, that is this is pelvic ascites, this is uterus transverse section, and this is the uterus longitudinal section, and this is still pelvic ascites because both these things are in continuity. And this is actually called the TIE fighter sign, like the Star Wars uh, uh, fighter jet. So this is fluid here, this is fluid here. Uterus is floating in this pelvic ascites uh, with these ovarian ligaments together, it's called the, uh, it appears like a tie fighter, it's called the tie fighter sign. So you have the uterus here, you have fluid here and here. And when, if the bladder is full, uh, the bladder will actually like come anterior uh, to the uterus and you can have anechoic structure in front of the uterus, which could be bladder also. But in this case, it's, li it's most likely ascites. So here is your last question, but a slightly different one. So this is a 30-year-old patient with diabetes mellitus and hypertension who presents with headache, bloody vision, and a very high blood pressure of 220 over uh, 160 millimeters mercury. You do a ocular ultrasound. What does the arrow point to? We don't commonly do ocular ultrasound, but this is one of the few situations you might want to do um, where it's really useful. So are we looking at retinal detachment or vitreous hemorrhage or papillary edema or is it uh, pus in the anterior chamber? So just to orient you a little bit, so we are looking from the anterior aspect, and this is the anterior, this is posterior, this is the globe, and uh, that means this is retina, and this is the optic nerve complex, and this is the optic disc. So you are seeing that the optic nerve complex uh, is wide, and there is optic disc cupping here. So the most likely diagnosis is papillary edema. So how do we do normal eye sonogram? You use a linear transducer, that is high frequency transducer, and you need a lot of gel. You ask the patient to close the eye, and you put a lot of gel on the um, closed eyelid. Uh, and usually gel doesn't cause any problems with the eyeball, so uh, don't hesitate to put more gel. And some doctors put uh, transparent film like Tegaderm uh, on the eyeball um, so that it, it reduces the patient inconvenience. So you, you ask the patient to um, look straight uh, without clenching the eyeball and you get a nice picture like this. So here, this is the cornea, this is the anterior chamber, 
this is the iris, this is lens, uh, all this black thing is vitreous, and this is the retina, the posterior part of the eyeball, and here this hypoechoic area is the optic nerve. And like when you have raised intracranial pressure, it is transmitted um, into the optic nerve complex and it becomes wide. So one thing is you might see optic disc cupping here, like you saw in the previous picture. Um, but the m important sign is to note how, um, how big is this optic nerve complex. So where do you measure this? So you measure this three millimeters uh, beyond the uh, papilla here, and you measure the horizontal distance of this optic nerve sheath. If this diameter is more than six millimeters, it should alert you to the presence of raised intracranial pressure. Thank you, and uh, if you have any comments or interesting pictures to share with me, um, uh, this is my Twitter handle dedicated to um, nephrology-related point of care ultrasonography. Thank you.